Welcome to the I Will Repay Church and Reparations session. This is a partnership event and it's organized by the Racial Justice Advocacy Forum, the National Church Leaders Forum, and the Movement for Racial Justice. A particular welcome to our speakers tonight. We look forward to hearing from them. We have Professor Robert Beckford, we have Alicia Lewis, and we have Ronald, or Reverend Ronald Nathan. Just allow me to go through a few housekeeping rules before we move on. So I'm asking if you can mute microphones, but do feel free to leave your cameras on during the presentation. This is an interactive session with a Q&A later. So from the offset, when you start to hear from our speakers, do feel free to post your questions in the chat box. We do not have a raise hand feature here. These questions can be general or they can be to a named person, but I can give more direction later. And you may have heard this session is being recorded and also broadcasting on Facebook Live. Welcome. Tonight's session, I will repay church and reparations. The discussion has three ambitions to articulate the various Christian positions around reparations, to equip the church to speak with confidence on reparations, and to help solidify the Christian work around reparations. So allow me to set a context. Since the murder of George Floyd, our nation continues to reckon with the consequences of our stained history, both uh, with race and justice. Too often national policies are colorblind, and what's needed are policies that acknowledge how race and racism impact how black people experience life in this country. To be blind to race is to be blind to justice. In the ecumenical movement, the theological starting point for racism is the declaration that racism is a sin, violating the image of God because it violates the principal belief every human being reflects the image of God. Tonight's uh, webinar will explore the theological case for reparations using sin, the sin of racism, as a starting point. Before we move on to our speakers, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all three, I'm going to hand over to Elisa Lewis. Uh, who's also representing the Racial Justice Forum. Elisa has recently completed her PhD, so soon to be Dr. Alicia Lewis, and her research focuses on the presence of black nationalist uh, religions and the influences that they have on the fringes of the black British church body. Alicia. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Dion. Um, good to see and um, yeah, share this time with everybody. So this is just a little bit about what the Racial Justice Advo Advocacy Forum is. And so it's an ecumenical Christian entity birthed um, this year by a uh, Richard Reddy and Wale Hudson Roberts, um, and it seeks to speak prophetically on behalf of black and brown Christians to the government on racial justice challenges and reparations. The forum comprises of representatives from various Christian institutions, such as the Ascension Trust, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, churches together in Britain and Ireland, the Evangelical Alliance, the Methodist Church, the Religious Society of Friends or Quakers, the Salvation Army, the Sam Sharp Project, and the United Reformed Church. In response to the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities report, this, um, we produced our own response um, earlier in the year as one of our first publications um, at grouping together our ideas for how the church can engage in these discussions and not stand on the sidelines. And so, as I said before, it's only recently come into birth, it's primary catalyst, a Black Lives Matter and all that they were doing um, and <clears throat> almost putting uh, churches to shame 
in their birth there. Um, and those inputting into its development, including colleagues from the Ascension Trust and all the people that we've mentioned before, just really working together um, to challenge the government, hear Brown and Brown Christians' concerns for structural and inter institutional change. And so far we've produced, as I said, a response to that ethnic um, disparities report. And tonight, as Dion has also said, we are partnering with um, the National Church Leaders Forum and the Movement for Justice and Reconciliation, um, all for facilitating um, black Christian voices, brown Christian voices, um, and taking our voice, our Christian voice to government seeking change in society. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And so to our first speaker, doesn't need much introduction. He's well known to all of us, Professor Robert Beckford, giant in the world of black theology. And Robert is going to talk to us about the theological case for reparations. Robert, over to you. Let me just... Uh... Let me just unmute and uh, show myself again. There we go. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, what I want to do in this presentation, I'll be given 15 minutes, is uh, to talk about the theological case for reparation. But what I want to do is go beyond just thinking about it theologically. I want to look at how this has been played out in popular culture, particularly black religious popular culture, and also think about some of the reasons why the church has been so slow to move on this particular issue. But before I get going, I just want to thank the organizers for putting this together I think it's a fantastic opportunity to explore is a really really pressing issue has been for some time within the christian church so i really want to thank wale and also um richard uh, for getting this together and for all the other people who've been uh, who've participated to make this possible this evening so look let, let's um uh, let's kick off then by looking at what the the the, the, the main theological ideas are behind a reparation look there's three powerful things in from the scriptures. Firstly, there's in the New Testament what Jesus has to say about the whole thing. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Uh, Zacchaeus spends a great deal of time exploiting people financially. He's confronted by the person of Christ. He repents and he decides that he's going to repay uh, uh, manifold uh, as a consequence of his exploitative activities. So we have within the life of Jesus a tradition of saying that if you have unjust gain, if you've made money, through exploitation, through brutalizing, terrorizing people, uh, you've got to pay back. And you haven't just got to pay back uh, the amount that you've taken, you've got to pay back with interest, with generosity. It's not just there in the life of Jesus, it's uh, Paul and Philemon uh, getting on the act. There's that statement which uh, we use for this uh, evening's uh, title, where Paul says to Phi Philemon, look, the money that you've lost as a consequence of Onesimus uh, get going uh, absent, I, I will repay you. You know, I'm, uh, Paul said, recognizing that where there is damage done, there is a need to repay. Now, the Old Testament gets in on the act and gives us a much more well-worked out framework for dealing with reparations. Numbers 5, 5 to 7 says, The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, uh, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way, and, in so, and so is unfaithful to the Lord, is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. So there's first of all recognition of what's happened, confessing the sin, and then they must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person they have wronged. So again, yeah, the whole idea that you must recognize that there's uh, been some exploitative activity, that you have to do something about this in terms of repentance, but you have to give back. And it's not just a case of giving back. Uh, the amount that was taken, adding interest uh, as an act of repentance and, rec and restitution in order for the reconciliation to take place. So the biblical text from Jesus projecting back to Moses is quite clear on this. Unjust gain has to be accounted for. You cannot get away with exploitation. So how has this worked out in terms of slavery reparations? Well, the interesting thing is this, is when the British government uh, got into the act of reparations after the uh, abolition of slavery, 1834, 1838. We'll talk about those dates in a little bit. Uh, they got it kind of twisted. Uh, they gave money to the oppressors, uh, not to the people who had been exploited, brutalized, terrorized, raped and tortured. In fact, 20 million pounds in old money went to paying off the slave owners. And we know that the Church of England uh, and also 
uh, some ch uh, church leaders within the Church of England were recipients of this. Um, Church of England got in on the act of slavery much earlier on in 1710 in Barbados. They bequeathed a slave plantation, the Codrington Plantation, which the church is happy to run for 130, 140 years, despite it being one of the worst plantations in Barbados. You know, so uh, they get on the act. But the, when the government get hold of this, they twist it. The, 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 the terrible irony about this is that they give nothing to the enslaved people. What does that say about the value of black bodies, of black lives, of slavery, and where it sits within the British imagination, within the Christian imagination. 500 years of a sojourn with racial terror and no account. It gets even worse when you think that theological students don't even look at this 500 year history. It doesn't even count. British theological history, that's 100 years. Only one book written to address this issue, one book. 50 years, nearly 100 books written by white theologians about being nice to animals. Only one book daring to address this issue. The tragedy about the reparations when the government gets hold of it is that uh, also, not only did they pay the oppressors, it's kind of twisted, but they asked the oppressed to pay back. What we don't remember about the 1834, 1830, 1838 settlement is that enslaved Africans in the West Indies have to work for four years for free. And that pays off the other half of the uh, 20 billion pounds, uh, 20 million pounds. Half of it is paid for by the enslaved people. And if that isn't bad enough, we've all been paying for it. Because, um, as uh, sorry, this isn't a great um, uh, uh, image that they kind of um, got distorted with the blog. We even know that up until 2015, everybody in Britain was paying off that debt that uh, month the government borrowed to pay off the slave owners, including black and brown people. So, can you imagine? We were told Wilberforce abolished slavery. Well, that isn't completely true. Slave trade continued after 1807. I've even heard prominent theologians say, we abolished slavery twice. Well, not quite. We pay for it. We pay for it, literally. We work for four years for free. And then the descendants of enslaved people like me, through our taxes, we pay for it. Doesn't sound very benevolent. So, you know, when the government gets hold of reparations and the idea what the Bible says about it is completely twisted. It goes to the oppressors, not to the oppressed. Reparation is a big theme in black popular culture. Uh, we have to remember that the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica, the parts of Europe since the 1960s has been petitioning the crown for reparations, primarily to go back to Africa, but a recognition nonetheless that 500 years of slavery, colonialism has to be accounted for. It's a crime against humanity. It, it is not only an economic, psychological brutality, but it's deeply spiritual. African-American uh, religionist Charles Long talks about the coming of the West on Africa as a spiritual process, an occult practice which brutalizes not only the body, but brutalizes the small soul. When you destroy cosmologies, you're destroying the spirit of the people. It has an occult feel to it. So Rastafarians recognize this. Bob Marley talks about on the slave ship, how they brutalized our very soul, recognizing that slavery and colonialism wasn't just about economics, it's about brutalizing, terrorizing, destroying the spirituality of a people. Uh, even Martin Luther King gets in on the act. Remember, there's a part of the I Have a Dream speech, which we don't like to talk about, the first uh, 1500, 1800 words, because King gets heavy. The first part, before he gets to the dream, he has to talk about the nightmare. Part of the nightmare is a recognition that America owes black people, owes people in the black people in the diaspora. Uh, King says, and it's obvious today that America has defaulted on its this uh, promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad a black a bad check, send a blank check, a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity in this nation. And so we've come to cash this check. King is saying he wants reparations. Where's the money? Where's the check? That's what we've come for. Did Martin Luther King recognized that rep repertory justice was an integral part 
of racial reconciliation and more recently CARICOM, the Caribbean uh, nations getting in on the act in uh, political culture, recognizing that uh, there has to be reparation for the damage done. So it's part of popular culture, not just within the church tradition, it's deep within uh, black popular culture and more recently, uh, University of Glasgow being one of the first institutions to make reparation, we know that Lloyds Bank, we know that Green King and even other banks uh, are looking into this as we speak in terms of paying reparation for their part in the transatlantic slave trend, Caribbean slavery. Let's call it what it is. It wasn't just about slavery, it was slave labor camps. It was racial capitalism, exploitation of black flesh. It was racial terror, uh, you know, brutalizing people because of their black skin. So why is there this opposition to it? Well, I made a song about this few years ago as part of a research project, Jamaican Bible Remix, where we looked, we cut in parts of a film that I made on reparation 2005 called Empire Pays Back. We used some of the visuals from that. And the audio is a discussion that was had with Andrew Marr on the start of the week program. And he just re-articulates the resistance to reparations from the British nation. I'm just going to play a part of this and then move on. Now, 15 minutes, I calculate this would be six minutes and everybody would be within the, the time frame. But if it isn't, I'm going to cut it short. But just listen to some of the reasons Andrew Marr gives for this not uh, taking place. Introducing Dr. Leslie Henry lyrics on the Jamaican Bible remix. Paul letter to Philemon. Should Britain pay reparations and make a formal apology to the descendants of slaves? Much of our imperial and business strength has its origins in the slave trade of the 18th and early 19th century, and the academic Robert Beckford argues in a new television program that the empire should pay back. If him did do not wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do not wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. Let's start with uh, the scale of slavery. You compare it in the program to the Nazi Holocaust. For several decades of the slave trade, it was cheaper to bring in Africans, work them to death, and then replace them. So we're looking at genocidal conditions on the Caribbean plantations. The complexity of our condition is what you fail to comprehend. Historically turned into chattels, beast of burden, less than men, thinking the only way to survive is to pretend to be you, mocking our very existence, animals in your human zoo. If him did do not wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back, pay you back. If him did do not wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back, pay you back. There are two um, sort of almost instant default defences made by a lot of British people when this is raised. The first is that actually the slave trade was something that was driven from Africa itself, that it was uh, Muslim uh, Arab slave traders uh, moving down south and the people in the sort of center, center ground of, of uh, West Africa in particular were behind the slave trade. What we focus on is what the British did. I'm not that concerned with what one ethnic group did to another ethnic group in Africa. I'm interested in how the British participated in it the huge profits that were made and the incredible economic benefit to this country and also the underdevelopment of Africa and more so the brutalization of African people in the Caribbean. Where are your names in our brains? African cultures disrespected. Educated against ourselves is why we wind up disaffected. The saddest case in the saddest place even these words leave a bitter taste in my mouth because as an african to you i'm human waste if him did do not wrong to you or him owe you we pay you back pay you back if him did do not wrong to you or him owe you we pay you back pay you back the second defense mechanism people say is well it was britain uh, which uh, ended the slave trade. It was it was it was Wilberforce, and then it was the Royal Navy, and that Britain's got a lot to be proud of in stopping the slave trade. When I was taught history, I was always told to approach it from a multi-dimensional perspective, to look at what happened in the subjugated histories, not just read history like TV history from the good and the great. 
In the Caribbean, they talk about the slaves who ended slavery. The fact that there were rebellions across the Caribbean in the 1830s that made slavery economically impossible and just not viable. So we know that Britain ended the trade in 1807. We know that the slavery was ended in 1834, 1838. It took a little bit of a while for it to work through. Yeah, I'm going to cut it there just for the interest of time. You can watch it online. Um, I can give you the link uh, later on if you want to. Want to. So we know that um, there are excuses that are given. You know, the excuses tend to be that it's a long time ago. Britain should be proud of its role in abolition. Well, we've kind of debunked that already. And we know that it didn't kind of work out exactly as they say that it did. And then they tried to blame Africans for being participating in the trade. Well, the Africans have kind of owned up to it, you know, and I've made apologies. Uh, I several West African countries, some of them even offered a reparation to the descendant of enslaved, pe enslaved people. And we know that the church uh, has something to atone for, uh, the Anglican church in particular had uh, as, uh, recently looked at the origins of some of its uh, funds uh, to see where they have links with the transatlantic slave trade. We know that the church, there were church leaders and also uh, church organizations which received compensation in the 20 million pound um, settlement. So there is a case to be, be had. So, so why is there resistance in the church? And I want to end with this. Well, I think there are three reasons. I think there's ignorance. People just aren't aware of this history because it isn't taught. It's hidden and it's hidden because the church likes to pretend that it didn't play a role in the subjugation of black bodies. It's hidden because the church didn't like to acknowledge that many of the ideas uh, that shaped the Christian tradition are steeped in racism and they don't actually produce anti-racism. And thirdly, there's a lack of moral, lack of moral courage, the kind of courage that's needed to acknowledge this wrong and do something about it. There isn't that kind of leadership or that courage to do it. The courage is coming from the secular world. Uh, Glasgow, Scottish, Glasgow University. It makes you wonder where the spirit of God is moving. And, and the Church of England, Methodist Church, Anglican Church at this point, it's moving in Scotland. It's moving in that West. It's moving in um, uh, uh, Bank, uh, Bank of Scotland. It's, it, 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 you know, I wonder where God's spirit is happening. So it's moving on this. So look, we know that it must happen. And I'll just end with this. I think there are three reasons why it must happen. It must happen because our faith demands it. Oh, two reasons, sorry. And you know what? I think reparation for the transatlantic slave trade from the context of the church is ugly. The most powerful witness of racial reconciliation in Britain ever potentially has that power to be that way because it's acknowledging that the church's original sin, this ability to recognize and see the full humanity of black and brown brothers and sisters in the West Indies uh, has to be atoned for. And by atoning for that and reconciling for that, I, think, I, I don't think there's a more powerful witness in terms of racial reconciliation that the church can engage with at this particular point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. The presentation was filled with knowledge, truth telling and was visually um, powerful. So thank you for that. Lots of questions already coming through. Apologies for those online. They didn't see Robert's face. We couldn't see you, Robert, but clearly you were um, using your screen for the presentation. So we will see Robert's face soon and certainly in the Q&A session. Next, we're going to hear from um, Alicia Lewis. And Elise is going to spend her 15 minutes talking to us about the response of young black Christians to reparations. Alicia. Hi, thank you once again. And thanks so much, Robert, for grounding us, grounding reparations theologically and in the popular context, and for indeed reminding us that reparations is biblical and the business of the church, a direct action and a means for seeking justice in society. Um, so there'll be some overlap actually. Today I want to present some ideas and questions that speak to young black people engaging in conversation of racial justice, specifically reparations and the role of the church. And just again to give some context, my own research is concerned with those young black people who have left mainstream church and joined other Bible reading black religious groups. And I say this to frame this contribution and also to ground it in black British reality. Young black people have seen and rejected the silence 
of the mainstream church on racial justice issues such as reparations. They believe that God is committed to justice for black and brown people and they are seeking spiritual religious spaces that help them to make sense of the overlaps between society and religion, lived reality and God's divine plan. Social media, of course, is the window into the world of the younger generation. And although there's a lot of misinformation, shallow behavior, questionable content, and often a, a, a bent towards promoting narcissistic tendencies and traits, the trends and patterns reveal a lot about the collective thinking, questions and influences on young people today. And to paint a broad picture on my own feeds, which is 90% black interest pages, um, there is a heavy overlap between social issues, politics, culture, religion, and anti-religion. Social issues being promoting black businesses, police brutality, ethnic disparities, at the minute quite popular missing black persons, education, and relationships. Politics, the two party system and where black people fit into these white majority parties, their philosophies, Operation Black Vote, mobilizing and protesting. Unculture, preserving black cultures, interrogating black cultures and uncovering black cultures, hidden ones in our history. And then on the religion frame and anti-religion, anti-white colonial Christianity, engaging in ancient Afro-Asiatic religions or black humanism. And so this is just a very broad insight into the social media world of young black Britain, how they overlap and, and what topics and trends. And they're vast complex spaces and many young people are navigating them without support from their church communities. Often in the comments, there's this ongoing conversation about reparation. But some people might even ask themselves, do young people care about reparations in the same way the generations before have? And also now in the 21st century, there's evidence for both clear ethnic disparities. And yet despite these difficulties, success, success and growth among young black and brown people in Britain. So people may ask, is reparations really the answer if young people are able to find ways to successfully navigate 21st century globalized society through education, the workforce, entrepreneurship, young black entrepreneurs being YouTube stars, athletes, entertainers, business tycoons. But yet, as we'll see, even our household hip hop artists live in flashy, lavish lifestyles feel the moral burden to petition for reparations. So the real question that follows this introduction, those introductory questions are, where are we, the church in the room? What is our contribution to the conversation among young people about reparations? What do we say in light of other black religious interpretations or Black Lives Matter, Pan-Africanism, hip hop and the inter entertainment industry? How do we measure up and engage with these assertions, petitions, protests and moves for action? Where are we? For too long, it seems the church have left it to a few scholars, as Robert said, a book, one book, and Christian activists to say their piece, but are we as a church not theologically and morally obligated to follow through with action, be it the black majority churches to mobilize and protest and the historical European denominations and contemporary white majority free churches to respond with reparative action? Are we not to teach our young people the biblical principles for reparations as part of our service to God and one another as light and as salt? The black political and religious spheres on the community social levels are bursting with reparative conversation and intent. Black Lives Matter is always a key example of a youth movement that demands reparations. They often get a mention because they've made such huge waves, a big impact on recent discussions and reparations being a key part of their vision. Afro-Asiatic diasporic religions, such, such as the Nation of Islam, Hebrew Israelites, and as uh, Robert mentioned before, Rastafari, maintain strong influence in the theological and social political imagination of younger people today. It's not a movement of our parents and our grandparents. They're still very much making waves and maintaining a firm influence on, on the fringes of the Black British body, on social media, 
Um, and so it's important um, to, to engage with their contributions um, as they overshadow, for the most part of the church, our own. Um, and it's not only because it's part of our ethnic heritage and legacy, but because the sentiments, beliefs and ideas are relevant to the struggles of today. They assert theological ideas about justice based on biblical interpretations and their experiences, setting the struggles of the now into the broader context of God's plan for humanity, for which Black people are central characters, not peripheral characters. They fulfill these religious, the religious spiritual gap that engages passionately and intentionally with issues such as reparations. So as mentioned before, again, Rastafari embed their ideas of reparations strongly in repatriation, European American governments funding the return and establishing the um, diasporic communities into Africa. And then we have um, an, an older quote from Malcolm X, which still makes waves and um, is still influential. And his ideas positing that black people are owed a section of America exclusively, exclusively for themselves. And he says now at the same time, so this is from a, 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 um, a recording, um, he says, let us go back home to our own people and our own homeland. The government itself is leading is the leading opposer towards any mass element of black people becoming orientated in the direction of home. They put forth the effort to stop this. So what he says is, since you can't give it to us here mixed up in your house and you don't want us to go back home to our own people, then the only alternative is to separate the house. Give us a part of this country and let us live in that part. And so all these are considered maybe marginalized or outdated ideas. They are very present and inspirational for young black activists and thinkers and just the ones that scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Another example from the Hebrew Israelite community, they're saying we have not been repaid. And when they um, reflect in one of their teaching sessions um, on this matter of reparations and enslavement, they refer again to scripture. Jeremiah 22 13 and it says woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice who makes his neighbors work for nothing and does not give them their wages who says I will build a house myself a spacious house with large upper rooms who cut out windows for it paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion are you a king because you compete in cedar did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Is this not to know me, says the Lord? But your eyes and heart are your only dishonest gain for shedding innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence. Further on in 22, it says, the wind shall shepherd all your shepherds and your lovers shall go into captivity. Then you will be ashamed and dismayed because of all your wickedness, O inhabitant of Lebanon, nested among the cedars. And the sentiment there is that they're, they're tying um, this in Jeremiah, building this house on unrighteousness, forcing people to work for nothing, and then the judgment of God on those people as their contribution and as part of their ideas towards reparative justice, towards ideas about oppression, and, and God's response then as well. So putting forward very strong ideas, again, that some people feel particularly the young people that I work with, the church are yet to be as strongly assertive about. And my final example is Rapper T.I., who presented an open letter online as a tweet um, to Lloyds of London Bank. It has come to our attention that your company was built on the blood, sweat and tears of our ancestors. We have seen you apologize for your shameful role in the transatlantic slave trade, but that simply is not enough. I must take direct aim at the fact that while many corporations and organizations like yours denounce past behavior, verbally accept accountability and even share public sentiment of contrition, there never seems to be enough if any consideration or serious discussion about how to repay the descendants of the African slave. And he goes on to follow up with action points that Lloyds Bank can do to engage in reparative justice and so back to my questions. 
following these examples of very assertive, very sure responses from biblical and social perspectives to reparations, where are we, the church, in this room? What is our contribution to the conversation among young people? What do we say in light of other Black religious interpretation? Black Lives Matter, Pan-Africanism, hip hop and the entertainment industry. How do we measure up and engage with these assertions, petitions, protests and moves for actions? Or are we saying that it is not a church issue? Young people do not need inspiration to protest. That's a given about anything, but they need guidance. And reparations is not a national issue like maybe privatizing the NHS or a council issue about the color of our bins. This is a moral biblical issue that we should be bringing to the world. We should be the light and salt. And so I'm gonna leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alicia, again, um, for your interventions there uh, and unpacking some of the historic associations of activism in the pursuit of reparations, a very live question, where are we the church in talking about these issues? And what are we saying about protests and the call for action? So very live questions that I hope we can further unpack as we go uh, forward. And our last contributor for this evening is uh, the Reverend Ronald Nathan, um, uh, representing the National Church Leaders Forum. Ron's 15 minutes really uh, addresses the response of the Caribbean Christians to reparations. I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, Ron is joining us from sunny Barbados. Uh, which is very inspiring given that Lisa, uh, Alicia is in sunny Brixton, maybe not, and I'm assuming Professor Beckford, you are in Birmingham. So welcome from Barbados, uh, Reverend Juan. Okay, thank you very much, Dion, and I want to thank the organizers uh, of this webinar. I uh, appreciate it very much to get a platform like this to be able to even speak on such a subject of righteousness and justice. Uh, just to say that, uh, Dion, when we started speaking, it was sunny. Now we are having a very heavy tropical shower. All right. Okay. Um, uh, my brief also uh, led me to believe that I had to speak towards the 10-point um, plan for reparations that come out of CARICOM. So I'm going to start from the point of view that um, I'm introducing the 10-point plan and then say something about what the church is in the region uh, is doing. What is the Caribbean community? The Caribbean community or Caribbean community and common market is a group of 20 developing countries in the Caribbean that have come together to form an economic and political community that works towards shaping policies for the region and encouraging economic growth and trade. They include Antigua, Barbuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago. There are five or, yes, five um, associate uh, members, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos Islands. Now, these, uh, this organization, CARICOM, uh, came together and in the uh, 2000s uh, put forward what is known today as uh, the 10 point plan for reparations. This was uh, CARICOM establishing a reparations commission which would be the body that would lead or establish the moral, ethical, and legal case for the payment of reparations by governments of all formal colonial powers and relevant institutions of those countries. It's interesting that they said moral and ethical, but did not say uh, religious. Uh, that is open for some comment um, later. However, um, the CARICOM reparations Commission immediately set about 
uh, putting forward or putting together this 10 point plan that would seek to address a number of issues. Just to say that the uh, Reparations Commission asserted that European governments, European governments ought to engage with them in a discussion because of the fact that one, they were owners and traders of enslaved Africans, two, that they instructed genocidal actions upon the indigenous peoples of um, the Caribbean, uh, Tainos, Ar Ar Arawaks, Caribs, etc. And uh, three, that they created the legal, fiscal, and social policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. Four, that they defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as part of their national interests. Five, that they refused compensation to the enslaved, which Robert um, uh, mentioned, but compen and uh, sorry, six compensated the slave owners, and seven that they imposed a future 100 years of racial apartheid upon uh, the emancipated. Uh, eighth that they imposed for another 100 years policies designed to perpetuate suffering upon the emancipated and survivors of this genocide. And finally, that the Europeans have refused to acknowledge such crimes or compensate victims and their descendants. So they were saying these are the grounds upon which we are calling for reparations. So the CRA or the CARICOM uh, Reparations Committee then outlined the path to reconciliation, truth, and justice for the victims and their descendants by calling for um, 10 things, and I'm not going to go into detail. One, a full formal apology. Two, uh, repatriation for those who wish to be repatriated. Three, indigenous peoples development program. Four, cultural institutions. Five, public health crisis. Six, Ill illiteracy eradication. Seven, African knowledge program. Eighth, psychological rehabilitation. Nine, technology transfer. And 10, death cancellation. Its primary strategy really was to take its message to every multinational institution, be that the United Nations, the Organization of American States, the Commonwealth, the World Trade Organization. Um, there is now a Caribbean, African Pacific, um, states organization to take this message to the European uh, countries, but also to these uh, multinational institutions to bring pressure to bear on Europe. And finally, if um, nothing gives, to take it to the International Criminal Court. Having said that, that is background to the CARICOM um, 10 point plan for reparations. I have found two prevailing attitudes in the Caribbean. Now I need to say that I have moved regularly between the Caribbean and Europe, and then Europe and the Caribbean and Africa. So I bring this kind of um, three different sites um, perspective to this. Uh, in the Caribbean, I found two attitudes which are primarily based on uh, ignorance, which uh, again, uh, Professor Beckford uh, mentioned, uh, but one, it is perceived by many Caribbean Christians that this has nothing to do with us. How they got to that point, um, it seems that it takes a lot of theological gymnastics to be able to do that. But uh, there's a perception this has nothing to do with us. Some of it is based on the fact that uh, people have an otherworldly idea of uh, the Christian faith that this is just about getting to heaven. And secondly, there is, in some areas where there's an interest in the conversation, they believe that there's nothing that we can do about it because Europe has said, we don't care. So these two attitudes I find predominant in the Caribbean, whether it's in the Bahamas in the North or the Guyanas in the South. Uh, as I move around, I hear these two prevailing attitudes. Not that they are not people in uh, the various Christian denominations 
who are speaking on these subjects, but um, there is very little unified force except among the Rastafarians for, well, no, let me correct that, except among the Rastafarians and to a lesser extent in some of uh, the Nation of Islam um, uh, organizations. Although CARICOM has been on the forefront in tackling this challenge and taking it to in international organizations, what I find also interesting is that CARICOM has not seemed to have uh, engaged Caribbean people in this discussion. In other words, the focus of the committee has been to speak outside to the Europeans and those who would hear. But there isn't any real lively debate on what we'll call the block, the corner, or the yard. And less so even in the churchyard. Okay. And to me, uh, the, the committee need to also engage a discussion among the people in the Caribbean because um, in many cases they're saying, what are they talking about? Who, and who are they talking about? Okay. So I, I think that there's need for um, uh, locating the discussion within communities, within uh, 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 the faith-based organizations, community-based organizations as well, and other parts of civic society. Uh, I, I wondered, um, I didn't hear Robert um, infer to any discussion about how the Black theology group within the UK engage the issue and discussions about reparations. So maybe Robert, when you come back, you could say a little about that. I know that at least there were three uh, or so um, articles within uh, the Black Theological Journal uh, that spoke to that, that uh, issue. And, but also even more so, the discussions that took place within our groupings and within our uh, various conferences that we held in the UK. As I close, I want to say that in my own local denomination, uh, I have been able to see some progress in terms of education and action. I am a minister with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we submitted a resolution for our church to engage the matter of reparations. We did it at the national level. So in Trinidad and Tobago at our annual conference. And then we passed it on to our general assembly, uh, which was held in the United States. And at the last general assembly in, uh, in July of this year, a commission was established with a mandate to take the um, reparation issue to uh, the other uh, main black church denominations in the US for further endorsement and action, and then to take it on to the World Council of Churches. So that's just an example of what can happen when there is uh, some level of sensitivity that you could go through um, whatever the processes is to bring it uh, uh, towards uh, some form of action, but also most of all, education and action. I want to say finally that uh, certainly from the Caribbean, we are saying to our diasporan brothers and sisters in the UK to raise their voice on this matter at a local, national, and global level of the church, but also in collaboration with others. And uh, so in the Caribbean, we are discovering that if we want to really move forward on the issue of reparations from a religious point of view, uh, we now have to have Christians uh, speaking with Muslims, speaking with Rastafarians and speaking to those who are of no faith so that we could bring the necessary pressure to bear. Because we really do need a tsunami type wave. Um, we can't just be talking about this uh, in our corners. We've got to uh, really bring pressure to bear. Thank you very much. Dion. Thank you, um, Reverend Ron. Uh, again, a, a great intervention. Thank you for sharing with us uh, some insight into the CARICOM 10-point plan, but also sharing some dynamics around 
the discourse within the um, Caribbean and what that looks like. If we can all come back online now, so I'm trusting that Richard can work his magic so that the panel can come back up. I can imagine from where you are, I think we have a healthy crowd, um, virtual crowd, virtual audience, and to say thank you to our um, speakers. So can we give them a, a round of applause? Thank you. I can see some questions coming in in the Q&A box, so keep those coming, please. Also feel free to put those questions into the main chat and we can pick them up from there. I want to, um, just before we go into some of those questions, and I think um, they're worth unpacking a little more, but just uh, if we can see everybody on the screen, Richard, that'd be great. But um, going back to uh, Robert's um, first presentation, I, I just wanted to pick up a, a question there. Around racial terror and brutality, you spoke a lot about that and, and quite passionately too, um, leaves us in, a, in an emotional state. But something that you said that struck me, I, I think I captured it right, reconciliation must happen because our faith demands it and I wondered what that process looks like for you. Yeah that's a really good question. Um, I think what it looks like is three things. I think it, it's firstly the churches who were benefited from the trade making a moral decision to atone for it both in word and in deed and that deed must mean some kind of reparation and because this was a financial gain the reparation should be financial in some way this is not rocket science it's being done by the catholic jesuits in america raising 100 million dollars because they use slave labor to build some of their churches um, it's been done um, by uh, uh, some, some, uh, um, some well, well, that's probably the best example in terms of a Christian organization. So I think that's what it looks like, first of all, acknowledging that. I think there's a second part to it, which is there is a moral obligation if we look at models of reconciliation, then for uh, people who have been the victims to then um, not only take the gift of reparation, but also offer a pathway to reconciliation through forgiveness. And that's a costly process. Nietzsche Bonifer talked about cheap grace costly. It's a costly process because it's not meant to be made easy. And for far too often in the past, we've made it an easy process, you know? Um, so I think that's what it looks like in part two. I think part three of it then means that we have the foundation for a new relationship, which includes speaking openly, truthfully about issues of race and racialized oppression and how Christianity has played a role and finding a new language that we can use to envisage a better future. So for me, that, that's what it looks like. And unfortunately, the first step hasn't been taken. Uh, and the second step has been made too easy. And the third step just doesn't exist. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. We'll keep unpacking some of those questions. And then to um, Alicia, uh, uh, and, and you shared with us, you know, uh, some uh, organizations and those, the great and the good who's gone before us and, and, and part of um, their contribution to the struggle. And several of, of, of you have talked about um, the, 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 the activities of um, Rastafari, so that tradition, and I wondered, uh, in 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 your thinking, is there something then that the church can learn from um, the Rastafari um, uh, tradition, not necessarily tradition, um, their their pathway of um, making a call for reparations? Do you think that there's uh, uh, something there worth learning? Hundred percent, and I think it's it's the intentionality. You know, they came together and they pulled together their theological and biblical understanding with their purpose in society um, to <clears throat> pursue liberation, um, decolonize 
and also battle Babylon <laughs> very, very intentionally. And I find that the churches, especially um, in my experience and why we've come here today is because there doesn't seem to be that same level of intentionality to get up and breathe and live reparations as if it, as if reparations is not <clears throat> in the same stream as other justice and um, pursuits that the mainstream church take. It's almost as if reparations is, is, is an alien form of justice and it's not, we've found and we've seen tonight that it's grounded in good um, Bible reading um, and there's a theological and moral implication then for us to pursue it. And what Rastafari do um, in their various ways um, and what we've seen from them is that they live it, they breathe it, they call it, um, and they're very, very intentional. Um, they're very sure about their theological standing. They're very, um, they put it, put our struggle um, and the sin of uh, Europe and America um, and the oppressors, the sin, they put it all into the bigger context of God's divine plan. And they don't just isolate it as these local issues. They bring it out into the bigger reality, which we all should be standing on as Christians. Um, and that intentionality is the lesson that we learn. That's the starting point um, of really um, embracing that the impact of Rastafari and moving forward. Thank you. That's a really good segue into my last question. This is a privilege I have then <laughs> as the chair. Um, into what Ron said. Ron, I was really struck by your call to locate the reparations discussion within the church locally, nationally, and, and even globally. But actually, we can't do this alone. We have to be working with others, whether those are of other faiths or just other allies within the struggle for social justice. If people are on this call, you know, and they are... Um, uh, within their, their church or put their part of a smaller group. How, how would you start that process? How would you start that discussion? Okay, um, I believe that uh, in the UK in particular, um, there is a discussion going on now with a wider group in regards to reparation. Uh, there's been a number of um, uh, very vocal uh, personalities who have spoken and we will need to establish some sort of link um, with them. Uh, certainly there is a regular march that takes place from um, Brixton to uh, our Westminster. Every year the church can join in there, but we have to make allies. Uh, we certainly know how to make allies when we need to get an offering. We, we know how to make allies when we need to have some large uh, uh, event in the Royal, Royal uh, Albert Hall or so. Uh, I don't see why we can't make allies in the pursuit for uh, justice in terms of um, reparations. Uh, we also uh, need to give uh, our people space to be able to have the discussion without condemning people and saying, uh, you know, that has nothing to do with salvation or with the program of the church. Uh, uh, we've got to make space for that. So we need uh, material and literature and visuals, audiovisuals on reparations, where it's got to get into Sunday school, it's got to get into the Bible study, it's got to come from the pulpit, it's got to be mentioned in the prayer meeting, uh, uh, in the youth meeting, everywhere. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, go into some of the questions and see if we can expand upon um, some of those. We've got uh, just under half an hour left, so keep those questions coming. There's been a, a few questions around um, either what is happening in Africa or what is the African response to reparations. And I know, Robert, that you offered um, an answer in, in to one of those questions. I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah. What is happening? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that Africa as a continent was a net loser from the transatlantic slave trade. It didn't gain anything. Uh, it lost money. Uh, it lost uh, its greatest resource, which was human beings. And consequently, as Walter Rodney, I noted, was um, underdeveloped by colonialism. So consequently, it, it didn't make any gain from it. There is, however, a moral case for thinking critically about the ethnic groups who colluded 
with slave traders to capture and traffic other Africans. There's a moral case there to be answered for. Uh, for example, we know that the Ashanti at one point had 80,000 men in arms, armed with guns made in Birmingham. Uh, so it probably didn't work very well. Uh, but they had 80,000 men uh, with guns from Birmingham. Uh, and they were using these guns to capture and traffic other uh, ethnic groups. So there's a moral case to be had. And that's one of the reasons why in the 1980s, Jerry Rawlings offered a compensation and an apology on behalf of the Ghanaian people for their role in the transatlantic slave trade. So I think there's still a, a moral case to be made, although we know the economic case is a weak one. Thank you. Dion? Uh, uh, Can I add? Yes, of yeah. course, please do. Uh, yeah, just um, two, uh, two points. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, Africa CARICOM Summit where the issue of reparations was also raised. And with this new alliance is coming a greater sensitivity um, about issues that are of, uh, let me say, mutual benefit. And so we, we anticipate, and certainly um, several of us who are in diasporan communities that is uh, connecting with the African Union, uh, we are also raising that issue. Uh, one other thing I want to say in regards to um, uh, Robert's uh, comment about groups that colluded, there is, at least in the Cameroon, um, I'm working with one group in the Cameroon that have put their hands up and said, hey, we are guilty, we participated in this, and we are setting aside uh, property and land uh, for those who would like to return so that we could also pay reparations to our own brothers and sisters. Thank you. I can see in the chat, Reginald uh, answers, the, the question was answered very well by the recent late president of Tanzania. I wonder if you could just come off mic and, and just share, share that message with us. Is that possible? I'm not sure whether um, uh, Richard uh, participants have access to the mic or not. Send me a message. No. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. If you could type something in the chat box, I I'd be very interested in, in um, or, or at least a, a, a signpost where we can find a, a little bit more about that message. Thank but, but you know, but you know, uh, just just to add, Dion, I think it's a false consciousness to be looking at the continent. I think the focus is on what the British did okay. and, and how they've denied it and how they've even convinced black people to deny it. And even the black church to deny it and not even talk about it. Because it's not just about reparations, it's what it symbolizes. It symbolizes theology and the church's complicity, past and present with racial terror. That's the big issue. And that's why reparations hasn't been talked about because it opens up a whole, how do you talk about the Church of England running a plantation for 130 years? How, 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 what, what kind of thinking, and here's where it gets really worse. How have they changed their theology since raping and torturing black men and black women on plantations for 100 years? How have they changed their theology? Not at all. That's the big question. You see, that's why it's a dangerous area to open up because then people have got to ask critical questions about who they're praying to. Because owning a plantation for 130 years and brutalizing people, that's not the work of God, that's the work of the devil. And if you haven't changed your theology since, since then, your theology in terms of black people is still gonna produce devil work. It's not gonna produce God work. And maybe that's one of the reasons why there's still issues of race and racism in the Anglican Church, Methodist Church. They have got to rethink their theological categories in light of this terror. Now look, this isn't nothing new. After the Second World War, Theologians in Britain invented post-Holocaust theology. This is my goodness. Look what Hitler did to the Jews. Look what the German church did to the Jews. We need to think about how we change our thinking about God after the Holocaust. 500 years sojourn with racial terror. Not one major conference. I dealt with whiteness uh, a couple of weeks ago, but in terms of white church and transatlantic slave trade, only one book. There's something sick. Christian imagination, white Christian imagination in Britain regards its inability to deal with this. That's a sickness. 
I think that's what we have to get. I'm not interested in Africa didn't make anything out of this. There are people worshipping God in churches on Sunday morning in churches in Britain that were built with the money from Genesis. How do you worship God in the middle of that? There's something sick about the Christianity here. That's what we've got to address. How do we get out of this sickness? How do we help everybody get out of this sickness? And step one would be? Step one, if I had a magic wand in terms of we'd have to reintroduce this into theological education. I would have, that's, what, that's the area I work in. I would have a reparations day in the same way that there is a racial justice day in order to make the church more cognizant. I would hold to account Archbishop of Canterbury, head of Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Moravian Church, Quake, hold them to account. And I would be saying, if I was a black church leader, black church leaders won't do this because most of them like to shout in the pulpit, but they're quiet when it comes to the street. That's called cowardice, called lack of moral courage. Ain't called being prophetic. It's called cowardice, where I come from. I would hold them to account and say, don't invite us to any more meetings until you start putting the money on the table because then we can have true racial re reconciliation. Problem is, too many of the black church leaders have been too happy to have a seat at the table of these powerful white folk. I think they get some closer to God by being at the same table, in the same room, rather than holding them to account for the wickedness that's been perpetrated against the African people for 400 years, 500 years. I wonder if any of the other speakers have got any any thoughts around that. And and I would say I I I, I agree with you, Robert. But I think you know there is a season of change, or we are in that you know uh, a moment of, of of change. Certainly in the last I would say you know fifteen months or so, and some of those churches I think are now looking at ways of how they do that. Very often, I think when we speak to these issues, it silenced the room with us inside the room as well. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, I know a piece of work that was done, um, uh, what are they, the, 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 the um, Church Mission, Church, Church Mission Society, Church Mission Society, um, but a big piece of work, Legacy of, on, on, of Slavery, you can research it on, on, online, and have now secured, you know, a huge pot of money in order to start that discussion, in order to start that process. But other speakers, please, um, any, 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 any thoughts of that? Not just the Church of England, I, I think you're right, but there were other, many other churches involved at what we call mainstream churches. But any thoughts before we move on to another question? Um, I think kind of just in line with Robert was saying, and just to reiterate what I said earlier as well about <clears throat> how this conversation lands with young people and the experiences that, that I've been writing about is because of this cowardice, they're going elsewhere. And not just for a political humanist experience and verb and movement, they want a spiritual and theological morally guided um, petition for reparations that they're not finding in these mainstream churches. And yes, in the last 15 months, I have also witnessed um, various um, projects happening, reparative um, projects happening. I'm working on one in particular, huge amounts of money, um, but it all still seems to be happening up there. It's not landing on the streets. The young people aren't in contact with these things. It may be years until they're able to realize and touch and feel this money. Um, but still, or whatever is the, the reparative form of justice there. Um, but really, the bridge is still broken. It's not landing. Robert's right, and also Reverend Ronald is right about these resources that we need. They're putting into the theological education, confronting it um, head on is so important because people are going elsewhere. Having these articles in the newspapers saying we've put 100 billion, that's great, on ground level, on Sunday, where's this conversation? On Sunday, where's the education? Those are the difficult things. Yeah, yeah. Some people can throw money out, you know. They can throw 100 million out and it might not even dent them. I don't know. But the most painful and expensive is the Sunday conversation, having to look people in the face and say, yeah, look at this wall built on the blood of your ancestors. What do we do about it? Those are the painful, but those are the small and beginning steps to changing people's hearts and minds and gather, mobilizing them together as a church, 
not just black people, everybody, it's a biblical issue, so therefore it's a church issue to address and reparations more seriously on Sunday. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Alicia, and I want, I want to throw out something else. I mean, in response to what you're saying, Dion, we have to remember English culture is expert in having a report and doing nothing. You know, red light should go off. A red light goes off in my brain when they say, we're going to have a report about this, we're going to sit on the committee. I said, my goodness, that, that really saying to me as a black people, person, you ain't really serious about this. We're just going to talk about it till you, till you die? Or what's happened with Windru Windrush? Oh, we have a commission. We're giving them compensation. People are still waiting. People are dying. Waiting for, we should be worried about that. First thing. Second thing is, I don't think we can work up, wait for the black church leaders to wake up. I, I think that we as Christian people have to follow where the spirit is going. The spirit, is, spirit has moved beyond the church on this issue. It's hovering over other organizations, some of them in the, in the so-called secular world. And maybe what we have to do is be a part of that movement. Those of us who are courageous enough, who are willing to step out in faith and support what's happening outside. Of the, outside. That's what I'm doing. I'm working with um, uh, institutions who want to do this and we are holding them to account. That's outside of the church. So we, ha we have to do that. Other thing to just add to this, which I think is significant as well, is that some theological institutions in North America have done reparation. They've said, look, mm -hmm. if, you're an, if you're a descendant of an enslaved person, you can come here for free. There's seminars who have done that. There's no Anglican foundation that's done that. There's, 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 there's no um, uh, institution that's done that yet. So these things are not difficult to do. So I just want to throw those out there as well. Uh, Robert. Uh, I understand that we, don't, we shouldn't wait for our black church leaders, but I am a little uncomfortable with leaving black church leaders off the hook or letting them off the hook, okay? Um, and, and so we have to find some way in which we provoke uh, black church leadership to uh, become courageous and become prophetic. And, um, and I agree with you that it has to happen within um, the way we understand theology, okay? Because if your theology is messed up, everything that you do is messed up. And our theology is messed up, okay? <laughs> how, how can we read the biblical text and say we are committed to the biblical text and not be committed to reparations? I completely agree. But I think yeah. we have to recognize yeah. that there's yeah. a colonial mentality or let's even let's call it what it is there's a colonial spirit that oppresses black church theology in britain colonialism said to black churches our enslaved ancestors and colonial subjects afterwards said to them two things don't think about your faith and you can't change the world 400 years later we still don't train our mm. clergy to a high standard and we don't do social justice that's spiritual oppression so i think you are right but i think mm. it's how we go about it we need to yeah. exorcise the black church from the demonic possession, oppression and, and possession in some places of colonial Christianity. That's because it's deep. It's not just rational. You can speak to pastors and say, this is the Bible. You're meant to be prophetic. Mm -hmm. And they still can't do it. There's something deep within that needs to be, I, I think it's demonic. And so uh, let me pick up on some of the current questions that are in the box and I, I'm going to group a couple together because I think that, you know, this is exactly what, what we speak into. Neville says, why is the church not willing to educate us on our history in justice and not speak up against injustice? Um, Susan also, Suzanne also says, do the panelists have any tips or advice on how to engage people who are scared off about or resisting talking about these issues so i think you you know all of you as panel members have said look you know this is an issue you know the silence i saw a comment in the in the a chat box silence is deafening so what can we do what can we do to um support uh, and encourage to to instigate these conversations and make the push and call for education in the churches on this thing. What tips could you give? If each of you could give a tip, what would it be? I'm conscious the clock is running down, but each of you, what would your tip be? Okay, Dean, I'm going to try to get in before Robert. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> uh, um, just, just to say that because the majority of people, uh, Black people in the UK, 
uh, engage Christianity primarily through the Bible. That's where I would start with um, uh, Black churches and Black church leaders. Uh, I'll, de I'll deconstruct the um, text. I would look at the application of the text to the current uh, situation and also show how the text actually address injustices in the um, time of Jesus Christ or whichever um, uh, period that we are looking at. But I would certainly address the issue through that which they feel most comfortable because I think that that could also make them very uncomfortable. Okay, Alicia. I'm getting in next for a bit as well, ladies first. Um, I think uh, my tip would be also just to <clears throat> find out, figure out a way to reframe reparation so that it is not, doesn't have this label of black victimhood begging and not getting over history because it's a form of biblical justice just like the other pursuits we see churches gagging to meet the needs of this is in line with a biblical form of justice and we need to help people to see that it is a part of God's heart for justice and a just world um, and it's not separate it's not alien it's not from the outside it's from scripture that's where we learn um, that's our foundation for reparation I, I, I mean, I've been talking a lot because I've got to leave slightly earlier than everybody else. So I've been making sure you get, I get my uh, two pence in first, um, two pence worth in first. I think there are three big things. I think that reparations can't be separated from issues around blackness per se and the church. We've got to be black people who love being black and being loving being, being black doesn't mean that we hate everybody else. It just means we appreciate what God has given us in terms of culture, ethnicity, our diversity. But we recognize that our blackness is a construction. You know, we're not we're not um, born this way. It's a social construction and we're celebrating the best of who we are. So we can't be separated from that. And one of the reasons why we haven't dealt with it is because we haven't dealt with that explicit sense of understanding and celebrating blackness. So, you know, we're coming to get to grips with it you with know, black history. But generally, we've been slow on the uptake in terms of in terms of affirming that blackness. I think the second thing is we have to look at educating ourselves and our churches. And if your church isn't going to do it, educate yourself. There are plenty of courses, Queen's Ecumenical Foundation, for example, in Birmingham, the Centre for Black Theology, there are numerous courses, you can look them up online, that are available that address some of these issues. I think part of it is, is um, the need for education of self, education of the church as well. And I think if there is a third area, then we have to be advocates. We have to be part of the movements that are happening outside of the church. We have to be pushing and asking our pastors questions, although sometimes this kind of thing can get you, get you in trouble because the pastors, because we haven't trained pastors to a high standard, many of them are just not fully conversant with the issues. So we get what we have put in the pulpit, you know? It's, it's tragic, but it's true. So if it means being part of an organization outside of the church, then I think we have to look at doing that. So those three things I think are really, are really important. It's bigger, it's about blackness, and where it sits within the Christian imagination. It also is about the education of ourselves, education of church communities, and also following where God's spirit is leading. Those are my, my three tips. And I'm afraid at that point, I'm, I'm gonna have to leave. I've got um, a, a, a slight issue to deal with um, uh, uh, that's pressing. So um, thank you again for having me this evening. I know there's still a good uh, 10 minutes for uh, Ron and Alicia to, to continue. Um, but again, thank you for having me on uh, this um, important discussion. Thank you for being with us, Robert. We very much appreciate you. Go well. So we're counting nine o'clock. We've got 12 minutes to go. Um, and I'm going to try and see if I can squeeze in about four more questions. I'm looking in the box. So I'm going to ask the, a couple of questions to Alicia and a couple of questions to Ron. Alicia, I'm going to start off with you first. Two questions from Beverly. One, she says, today in his speech, Boris talks about some people wanting to rewrite history. How can church address this? And then the second question is, how can we inform young people about reparations and get their voices involved in the debates and actions? I think you've given us some ideas, but if you could just um, pick up on those two, that would be great. 
Sure. Thanks so much, Beverly. I haven't been able to catch up on what Boris said today. Um, so my initial response is tell the truth and shame the devil. The church should be a light of truth, uh, rewriting history um, for unjust and immoral purposes is wrong. And at every point we should stand against that um, and stand for truth in history. Um, most assuredly, I'll do my best to catch up on that speech to um, even just form a better response for myself. And secondly, about informing young people about reparations we've said it already we need to develop the resources that collate this information particularly how it relates to the church theology we need to get that grounding as reverend ron said in sunday schools and on the pulpit um, as we talk about justice as we talk about forms of aid as we talk about the hand that we extend out into society we should be also talking about reparations and reconciliation and also getting there involved in the debate at local church level the debates need to be in existence for one they need to be there <laughs> you know it's for them to be involved um, we need to shore them up um, and give them space to develop their ideas interrogate their ideas as well as the ideas in the church so we need to have um, spaces where that they can learn more grow um, and and those are really the first steps anything from a website to books um, to conversations intergenerational conversations you sit down with our grandparents and parents they'll tell us about reparations they'll tell us about what it means not only biblically but in society they'll help young people to be able to look forward um, to seeing how um, imperative reparations is um, to the flourishing of black and brown peoples um, so yeah thank you Thank you. Um, there's a number of questions asking about how to access this conversation and the recording. I can tell you that it is being recorded live and will be available on the CTBI website tomorrow. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, Richard can post in the link to the um, CTBI website if people uh, need to take it. A couple of questions then for you, Ron. One from um, Eleanor Glasgow. She says, would, some, would any sum of money compensate for the loss of human life? I support reparations in the form of debt cancellation, economic fair trade, uh, educational opportunities and free movement of labour. How do you determine who should be recipient of any monetary reparations? Be well, uh, that's a big one. Um, the way CARICOM has sought to address that is uh, to look at uh, those things that will help to repair some of the damage that is taking place even presently with people of African descent or people who are descended from uh, Africans who were enslaved. So in the sense of our, our repatriation, uh, the building of indigenous uh, people's development programs, because we still have um, uh, many of the indigenous persons who have survived uh, in the region. Um, the addressing of the public health crisis, uh, the Caribbean has one of the highest levels of uh, diabetes in the world. And that is directly resulting from the fact that we were working on sugarcane plantations and what it has done to our DNA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, illiteracy eradication, African knowledge programs, uh, psychological rehabilitation, technology transfer, debt cancellation, all of those seek to deal with the issue of reparation from saying, uh, or whatever financial contributions are made, these things must help to eradicate future enslavement systems. Uh, we can't just talk about looking back at the past. I, can we actually pay for the life of a person uh, who has passed, uh, who has been killed or murdered in this way? I don't think so. One person um, when you think about them and their possible descendants, we are talking about thousands of people. Um, I, I don't think that we could actually deal with it like that. But what does happen is when you have a process of reparations, it is about 
at least uh, recognizing the damage and the hurt that has been done and seeking to repair that which impacts the future or the present and the future, I should say. Thank Was you. there a second question? Sorry. Yes, and the second question is from Israel. Welcome, Israel. Uh -huh. uh, is there a difference between reparative justice mm -hmm. and restorative justice? Okay. Um, I, I, I think I sneaked in an answer to um, Israel there, and I said it depends on how big you see the prison. All right? Um, it, in the sense that... Uh, uh, reparations is specifically seeking to address uh, the issues that have impacted uh, uh, people of African descent, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, etc., going back 500 years. Um, now, if you see the police um, uh, situation, uh, sorry, if you see the um, uh, situation of enslavement as a prison, then restorative um, justice can apply uh, in terms of the victim meeting, the, the person who perpetrated the crime, etc. So there is a relation there. But um, as I said, it all depends on how wide you see that uh, particular prison. There is no doubt with all of these questions, we could spend another hour um, unpacking and, and trying to work on the answers to some of these questions. I think for me, it is important that we keep these questions coming and we work together collectively to find the answers where we don't have them. Let's, let's work that through where we do, then let's take up you know, uh, uh, ourselves and be part of the solution. Our time is done tonight. So I wanna say thank you to our guests. Um, Robert has had to leave us, but thank you, Alicia. Thank you, um, uh, Ron. I think it's been uh, uh, a night where for me, th these issues feel personal still. And it feels as if both we engage our moral com compass, but those of us who are believers also a spiritual compass. Um, racial justice is linked to, you know, all the other justices. And, and it, it's been too long. I, I'm struck with Robert's um, sentiments of, you know, 500 years Plus, you know, how many books are being written about this? Why are we complicit? Why is the silence still, you know, deafening? Why is it still silent? Why is it um, uh, difficult to have the conversations? We have more questions than we have answers. But I'm pleased that in this first session um, from the Racial Justice Advocacy Forum, we've started the ball rolling. So keep those questions alive, discuss them within your own spaces, spheres, churches, uh, and I hope, you know, to be hearing the outcomes of, you know, a whole list of things, activism that is happening that we can all get involved and enjoy. I want to say thank you to the organisers and for their support, so to the uh, Movement for Racial Consideration, um, the Racial Justice Advocacy Forum, and of course, the National Church Leaders Forum. Thank you to CTBI for hosting us tonight. Have a good night wherever you are. Keep the conversation going. Thank you. <laughs>